So I'm actually going to talk with you about some of the con key considerations that um, uh, we make when we want to undertake a major strategic initiative, uh, such as a program like genomic medicine. And from uh, the C-suite viewpoint, um, which incorporates in our institution the fact that uh, we are a physician-led, physician-driven organization. So I'm going to talk to you a little bit first about the assets uh, of Geisinger because they actually were very key in our past 10-year buildup for a number of the programs that we've initiated. Um, you can see here that the mission is driven all around patients uh, and how we deliver care to our patients and more importantly, the outcomes that we achieve for improving their lives, uh, their clinical outcomes, and then overall, uh, the value uh, that we uh, actually achieve, not only for the patients, uh, but for the community, our providers, our health plan, uh, and the employers uh, of our region. Every five years, we do a uh, update of our vision for the organization. And Glenn Steele, who is our president and CEO, leads at least 50 um, uh, meetings across the entire system uh, in which we talk about major themes that uh, will represent Geisinger uh, for those five years. We do a five-year long-range financial model, and that cascades out to all of the components of our business, which I'll show you in a moment. The four themes uh, that have driven us for the past 10 years uh, always start with quality, uh, focused on the patient, focused on their uh, clinical care, coupled now with a major emphasis on innovation, much of which we have become known for in terms of clinical reengineering and value um, to the payer. We also are very focused on our market leadership. Uh, that translates itself into growth of the organization. Uh, we've gone from 10 years ago being uh, an organization of about 700 million uh, top revenue to now $3.4 billion, uh, and an employee base of about uh, 1,000 employed physicians uh, and uh, around 15,000 employees across the system. We now are going to initiate a very uh, large program in the scaling and generalizing of many of our uh, initiatives around innovation, uh, focused on uh, re-engineering the way in which care is delivered. And then our fourth major theme is around the Geisinger family, uh, improving the professional and personal well-being of our employees, as well as ensuring that we have the right skill sets of our employees to meet the future uh, direction of healthcare. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Geisinger is about a $3.4 billion uh, organization. We have a number of provider facilities. Uh, currently, we have two major clinical uh, campuses. Uh, the Geisinger Med Medical Center, which is located in Danville, uh, incorporates the Hospital for Advanced Medicine, uh, the Janet Weiss Children's Hospital, uh, a level one trauma uh, program for both pediatrics and adult, uh, and then a series of ambulatory uh, surgery clinics. Uh, our research enterprise uh, is actually part of uh, the clinical enterprise, and I'll talk about that in a moment. Our Geisinger Northeast uh, has two campuses. It's about uh, a 50-minute drive from Danville. Uh, also has a uh, level two trauma program. It does now have a Janet Weiss Children's Heart Hospital within a hospital uh, and a series of uh, clinics that surround it. We also have a alcohol and treatment, uh, chemical treatment dependency uh, institution. We have uh, now roughly um, 900 uh, FTE employed physicians uh, and roughly uh, translates to about 1,000 bodies. Uh, in our research area, uh, we have gone from about 80 FTEs, uh, that includes both um, uh, researchers as well as uh, support staff, to over 300 in the past 10 years. Uh, we include in our delivery of care uh, advanced practitioners, uh, and this will become important in a moment um, as we talk about the genomics medicine program. Uh, we also uh, have a health plan. Uh, we have about 300,000 members uh, in our health plan, and this is a very important component uh, of our integrated delivery system. 
Roughly 30% of the business of Geisinger uh, comes from the health plan. And in that 30% is where we really do a lot of our innovative work between uh, the clinical enterprise and the health plan. Our system, uh, the dark blue, represents the counties in which the health plan uh, has uh, contracts. And the heavy white line represents uh, where we provide clinical care, roughly in 43 of the 67 counties of Pennsylvania. Uh, these uh, clinics that are coming up represent uh, the 41 clinics, uh, our primary care clinics and specialty clinics uh, throughout the region uh, who are actually providing care locally uh, in the areas that they serve. Again, because Geisinger uh, is located in a series of rural communities, uh, many patients will not travel long distances to get health care. So the strategy um, way back when was really to establish a series of primary care clinics. Additionally, uh, we work uh, quite closely with a number of non-Geisinger uh, physician sites and have actually uh, provided electronic health record uh, access uh, to these uh, providers. We have now six helicopters uh, for our level one trauma program uh, and service the entire northeast and central Susquehanna uh, regions. Our regional demographics were important in considering uh, the development of a genomics program. We have about uh, just under 3 million uh, patients that we serve in the 31 county service area. It is an older, poor population. It is fairly homogeneous. Most people have lived in their homes for over 30 years now. Uh, this makes it really an opportune uh, locale uh, to be able to do many different kinds of research. In 1995, um, Geisinger started the electronic health record development. Uh, and initially, they started it in the ambulatory uh, settings, the various clinics that were not associated with the main campus. Uh, invested over 135 million uh, since that time, and now on an annual basis, uh, we spend about 4.4 percent of our annual buzz budget uh, in support of the electronic health record. Uh, the EHR is integrated not only in the community practice sites now, but also uh, each of the hospital platforms are fully integrated. And then we run a, a series of retail clinics uh, in which the uh, information flow back and forth to clinical sites uh, is through the EPIC um, uh, electronic health record. Uh, we also believe pretty strongly that we need to communicate with our community-based physicians. And so um, we created a portal uh, in which the physicians who are caring for patients that they refer to Geisinger um, can access their uh, patients' records. We have networked um, the uh, patient health record. We now have roughly uh, 178,000 active users uh, and are trying to achieve a goal of 200,000 um, in the near term uh, because this becomes an important facet for us uh, around um, not only monitoring uh, patients but also uh, in terms of uh, potential research opportunities. The um, Regional Health Information Exchange, the key high, uh, Geisinger led this uh, with about 18 institutions. Uh, now we have about uh, 500,000 active consented uh, users, uh, and it will provide for us um, a community data warehouse, uh, which will connect to our overall uh, data warehouse. Uh, we have a number of e-health uh, initiatives, again, because we're rural, uh, we've become the node for EICU uh, programs where we monitor patients at other institutions through an EICU portal. We also have tele-echo, tele-stroke, tele-derm, uh, and uh, many other neurology uh, and neurosurgery related programs by telemedicine. We were also uh, one of the recipients of a $16 million Beacon Grant, which is meant to connect five additional communities and achieve uh, improvement in the health outcomes of that uh, group of patients living in that area, uh, primarily around pulmonary disease. And then more recently, uh, we initiated a program called uh, Geisinger MyCode, uh, which is a voluntary patient um, uh, program uh, seeking to biobank uh, a number of blood samples. 
Right now, our biobank contains both blood and tissue, uh, and you can see here um, the growth of that uh, biobank. Uh, it was part of, and I'll show you in a moment, uh, the development uh, coming from our scientific advisory board recommendations back in uh, roughly 2003 uh, that Geisinger become uh, a biobank uh, as one of the steps uh, in the development of our genomics program. We have a clinical decision intelligence or data warehouse system uh, that provides uh, near real-time data. It is system-wide, includes all the clinical uh, research uh, and business data. Uh, we use it um, quite often uh, to both answer questions as well as ask questions around cohorts of patients. Uh, we clean the data. Um, you can get quite granularized uh, information. Uh, we're about to expand um, the core team that governs uh, the data warehouse, and as we've recruited additional clinical research leaders as well as those in our three centers, uh, we will be advancing um, both the depth and breadth uh, of the warehouse. So I'm not going to go through this entire complicated slide of how research was built at Geisinger um, early on, but if you look at the yellow area, um, Dr. Steele came to Geisinger in 2001, uh, and clearly uh, Geisinger has always been a great translational research uh, institution, but mostly focused on uh, clinical care in 2001. It had just come off the divorce uh, from Penn State Hershey. Uh, and given the population, given how it was situated in a rural community with an electronic health record and a population that was fairly stable and homogeneous, he felt that one of the intellectual cores that we needed to build out were a series of efforts around research. We already had a very good basic science, small core uh, research team in the Weiss Center, led by Dave Carey. That group has moved towards uh, a focus on genomics. Uh, the biobank actually sits inside of uh, the uh, Weiss Center for Research. We then focused on, uh, we needed to uh, have another intellectual core, which we focused then on outcomes research, population health, with the recruitment of Buzz Stewart uh, from Hopkins uh, to lead the Center for Health Research. We also felt pretty strongly uh, that we wanted to have a scientific advisory uh, committee made up of external advisors who could help us uh, focus on what the next generation of research would be, and clearly genomics was uh, a key piece of that. Um, you'll see some other milestones here in terms of recruitment, the recruitment of Peter Berger uh, to lead our Center for Clinical Studies. But later on, um, we actually, uh, moving up to about 2009, um, had talked with our board uh, about our interest in taking the first 10 years of research to another level over the next 10 years. And at each of our medical affairs committees, which are uh, committees of the full board, uh, we talk about different aspects of research on a quarterly basis and give them an update on our progress. We had been laying the groundwork uh, for doing a genomics medicine uh, program. So in 2009, uh, we put together a multidisciplinary uh, steering committee uh, led by uh, our chief medical officer at the time uh, and a consultant, um, and that was David Ledbetter at the time. Uh, and we had three of our board members involved in the weekly meetings for this committee so that we could debate, um, we could analyze, we could push back um, the development of what would be a recommendation to the full board. The vision uh, for research at Geisinger uh, is all around personalized health care uh, with a major emphasis on the genomics program. Uh, the board uh, and this multidisciplinary uh, steering committee believe pretty strongly that the clinical enterprise and our payer partner, Geisinger Health Plan, uh, would be able to really take a translational research, uh, translational clinical uh, program development opportunity uh, and really make it fairly strong. But there were criteria for that. Um, certainly doing a well-articulated uh, strategic plan and business plan with a return on investment uh, was key, uh, and to know that the board would support 
uh, investing in this effort uh, over the first few years. Both the clinical enterprise and the health plan uh, wanted to see that there was value created. And through the discussion uh, and, I would say, off-cycle debates uh, about it, uh, many of our clinicians supported the idea that we would be able to change the way in which healthcare would be delivered. Uh, and that was key to have a, a core constituency uh, who supported that uh, mindset. And that became evident every time we reported out uh, at the steering committee. And so the members of the board, none of whom uh, have a science background, uh, were really strong uh, in their support then uh, when we went to the full board. The key considerations in our overall process is that there had to be leadership at multiple le levels. Clearly, Dr. Steele uh, was a big champion uh, of the concept of developing such a program. Uh, but no doubt, he needed to ensure that the rest of the organization at the clinical levels, and not just the physician leaders, nursing leadership, uh, and at many of the support levels, our clinical laboratories, uh, would also be behind uh, the development of such a program because it requires resources. Uh, it requires almost a communication cam campaign. Uh, it required the articulation um, and almost a full communication campaign, uh, not only internal to Geisinger, but external to Geisinger. So we did talk to some of our community members uh, about the development of such a program. We also had to formalize um, in writing uh, our strategic vision and a 10-year business plan. Generally speaking, the first five years are the most credible, um, and that's what we actually use on our regular long-range financial model basis. Uh, but it had to be mul um, vetted at multiple uh, levels of the organization, uh, and then ultimately presented to our finance committee uh, for approval. Important also um, were some delineation of metrics, uh, both for quality and value, as well as outcome and process. Uh, these components, uh, again, had to be at multiple levels uh, of the organization. And our first um, major milestone would be to recruit um, the inaugural uh, executive vice president uh, for the organization of the uh, scientific area. Uh, we also had to identify for the board some of the risk and risk mitigation strategies. And one uh, which the board was very sensitive to are all the aspects of ethics um, around um, a genomics program. Uh, and while some of this is still playing itself out uh, in the development of uh, a full campaign around such, um, we are developing um, our thought processes uh, for uh, communicating uh, and uh, for resolving issues uh, that may come up. The other important factor for the board um, was to demonstrate that we had the capacity as an organization to take on such an initiative, uh, as well as a history of success in execution. So while it may seem a long period of time uh, to initiate a program, you can see the, uh, in previous slides the buildup uh, of all of the assets and the success that Geisinger was having from a management viewpoint uh, that the board felt uh, quite positive when it came to supporting an additional $20 million a year to invest in the research enterprise um, over these next 10 years. So where are we right now? Our first inaugural uh, appointment was David Ledbetter as our Executive Vice President, Chief Scientific Officer. Uh, David is, uh, has the umbrella responsibility for all three uh, of our centers and for integrating uh, specifically a genomics medicine program throughout the organization. David was able to recruit Andy uh, to join us, uh, and that's been invaluable in helping us to develop the education program, not only within the system, uh, but also externally. Uh, we were a recipient of the Emerge Award um, this year, and we have three new recruitments um, that have been uh, planned, and uh, we're quite happy uh, with having Ann Moon, who is a pediatric critical care specialist um, who does research in the genomics of developmental cardiac disease. And then Mark Williams and Janet Williams, uh, who will be joining us in January. Uh, we are 
almost, I would say, uh, in our infancy uh, in really cohesing um, the genomics medicine program. Uh, but I think within this past year, David's been with us a year, uh, we have really made a number of milestone achievements uh, that we'll be reporting to the board uh, actually at our December meeting this week. Uh, and then um, finally, we were developing a whole uh, restructuring of a bioinformatics core. Uh, which will be key in uh, executing the genomics program as well as a couple of our other uh, major strategic initiatives. So in summary, um, for us, uh, it's always important to lead with the patients and the patient focus. Uh, we communicated with our board early on that clinical medicine and research uh, really were partners uh, at Geisinger, that Research was not the icing on the cake, as Glenn would say, uh, but more part of the cake. Uh, and that was an important facet for the board to hear, especially the three board members on the um, steering committee for the 10-year vision for research. No doubt there has to be commitment at many levels of the organization. David and I, as executive vice presidents, uh, partnered together along with our executive vice president and chief medical officer uh, to ensure that the operational detail of the execution of this program uh, is well managed. And when there are hurdles, we figure out um, how to problem solve those hurdles. Uh, we also uh, feel pretty important uh, that there is a commitment uh, on the part of the organization to demonstrate improved outcomes for patients over time and to demonstrate for the board and other constituents uh, the financial uh, improvement uh, and value to the patients, the providers, the health plan, and employers uh, by improving the health outcomes uh, of the patients. Thank you very much. Questions? So in our um, weekly strategic meetings of the executive vice presidents, um, our general counsel uh, is part of our weekly meetings. So all of our strategic programs are um, in his limbic system, so to speak. Um, we do not have a very specific um, uh, program uh, related to the legal side. Uh, we do go through um, all of the discussions about what the potential malpractice implications uh, would be, uh, but we're not at that stage yet uh, in which we have developed a specific protocol. So you're really looking at it in the same way you look at a new imaging approach? Absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. So how are you going to try to demonstrate improved patient outcomes over time? So will you do that by comparing patients who are enrolled in your genomics effort versus those who do not? Or Right, or historical? Um, I would say it will probably be a combination of both. Uh, so right now, uh, for our, all of our programs, we look at best practice, uh, at what exists. And if something doesn't exist, then we have to use our own um, baseline uh, and compare it against our own baseline. So specifically? Simultaneously, contemporaneously. I mean, of course, outcomes are usually going to improve over time. Oh, we're long term. In trouble, right? Right. So how do we differentiate what's due to individualization of medicine versus what would happen otherwise? I think um, you know some of the clinicians in the room will have to um, uh, help answer that. But I think if we're tracking the clinical outcomes. Um, through the electronic health record. Um, again, we have generations of patient information uh, to track. Uh, that's the primary way it will occur. Yeah, and as a clinician who's going to be joining the program, I think this is where, um, you know, the groups like Intermountain and Geisinger and that have applied uh, quality improvement methodologies, which are uh, in some ways somewhat different than, uh, you know, more traditional uh, um, uh, highly controlled research uh, protocols to determine uh, improvement. Um, it, uh, this is 
harkens back to the idea that we need to develop these types of real world methodologies to be able to understand uh, you know, how much is due to just incremental improvement over time versus something that represents a true uh, signal from uh, a, a, a program. The, the example I use in, in, at Intermountain was a ventilator protocol uh, that within three months uh, reduced time on vent from um, an average of two days with a range of 12 hours to 14 days uh, to uh, average time on vent of four hours with a range of two hours to 12 hours. Now, um, does that, did that protocol, which involved the manipulation of 276 different variables in a clinical decision support system that was done at the bedside, meet uh, strict research uh, rigor and criteria? No, because a randomized control trial would control 275 of the variables and vary one. Doesn't work. Um, could you say, well, this is just expected improvement? Uh, over three months that we would see that change? No, that's clearly not the case. Something happened, it's attributable to the program, but um, it is a different paradigm in terms of how to actually do the work. And so uh, we really have to be very thoughtful about how we do this. Now, uh, there's uh, historical control approaches, there's implementation in different clinics. In other words, uh, with our Lynch syndrome program, we had early adopters. Uh, that wanted to get involved versus those that uh, uh, are not uh, involved. And so you can look at the outcomes uh, in clinics that adopt versus those that don't. There's different ways to go about doing it, but you can detect these signals. It's critical for us to be able to do that uh, because we're not, with the volume of information, we're not going to be able to do randomized control trials for everything. And so we do see ourselves as a rapid cycle uh, translational uh, platform. Uh, and knowing that it takes, uh, at least from you know, our days at other institutions, it, it takes you know, years to bring something to you know, fruition. Uh, some of these things we will look at differently. Um, Time for one last, Erwin? Yes, uh, am I on? Is yes. It, yeah, okay. So I, th I think this is one of the key issues that we need to address jointly. I think, you know, talking about generating the evidence, which is, I think, one of the key aspects that needs to be facilitate over the next five years is what kind of level of rigor, scientific rigor, uh, needs to be applied to uh, generating this kind of evidence in a best practice clinical care setting, uh, which is integrated, not separate from, uh, in a, not in a separate research setting. And then how can we disseminate that information? I think, you know, can we go to New England Journal and publish this kind? No, because they would say, well, you know, this is not randomized controlled. So we need to break into uh, some of these, uh, uh, break down some of these barriers. And I think this is an important topic to come up with the right level of protocol that is not prohibitive in terms of making progress, but also has a level of uh, rigor uh, that is sufficient to base decisions on, on the outcome, on the data. Yeah, that's an extremely important part. We, I think we need to uh, take our break now and we'll reconvene at 11.